Chapter Seventeen of the Metropolis by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The social mill ground on for another month. Montague withdrew himself as much as his brother would let him, but Alice was on the go all night and half the day. Oliver had sold his racing automobile to a friend. He was a man of family now, he said, and his wild days were over. He had got, instead, a limousine car for Alice, though she declared she had no need of it. If ever she was going to any place, Charlie Carter always begged her to use his. Charlie's siege was as persistent as ever, as Montague noticed with annoyance. The great law case was going forward. After weeks of study and investigation, Montague felt that he had the matter well in hand, and he had taken Mr. Hasbrook's memoranda as a basis for a new work of his own, much more substantial. Bit by bit, as he dug into the subject, he had discovered a state of affairs in the Fidelity Company, and, indeed, in the whole insurance business and its allied realms of banking and finance, which shocked him profoundly. It was impossible for him to imagine how such conditions could exist and remain unknown to the public, more especially as every one in Wall Street with whom he talked seemed to know about them and to take them for granted. His client's papers had provided him with references to the books. Montague had taken this dry material and made of it a protest which had a breath of life in it. It was a thing at which he toiled with deadly earnestness. It was not merely a struggle of one man to get a few thousand dollars. It was an appeal in behalf of millions of helpless people whose trust had been betrayed. It was the first step in a long campaign, which the young lawyer meant should force a great evil into the light of day. He went over his bill of complaint with Mr. Hasbrook and he was glad to see that the work he had done made its impression upon him. In fact, his client was a little afraid that some of his arguments might be too radical in tone, from the strictly legal point of view, he made haste to explain, but Montague reassured him upon this point. And then came the day when the great ship was ready for launching. The news must have spread quickly, for a few hours after the papers in the suit had been filed, Montague received a call from a newspaper reporter, who told him of the excitement in financial circles, where the thing had fallen like a bomb. Montague explained the purpose of the suit, and gave the reporter a number of facts which he felt certain would attract attention to the matter. When he picked up the paper the next morning, however, he was surprised to find that only a few lines had been given to the case, and that his interview had been replaced by one with an unnamed official of the Fidelity, to the effect that the attack upon the company was obviously for blackmailing purposes. That was the only ripple which Montague's work produced upon the surface of the pool. But there was a great commotion among the fish at the bottom, about which he was soon to learn. That evening, while he was hard at work in his study, he received a telephone call from his brother. "'I'm coming round to see you,' said Oliver. "'Wait for me.' "'All right,' said the other, and added, "'I thought you were dining at the Wallings.' "'I'm there now,' was the answer. "'I'm leaving.' "'What's the matter?' Montague asked. "'There's hell to pay,' was the reply, and then silence. When Oliver appeared a few minutes later, he did not even stop to set down his hat, but exclaimed, "'Alan, what in heaven's name have you been doing?' "'What do you mean?' asked the other. "'Why, that suit.' "'What about it?' "'Good God, man!' cried Oliver. "'Do you mean that you really don't know what you've done?' Montague was staring at him. "'I'm afraid I don't,' said he. "'Why, you're turning the world upside down,' exclaimed the other. "'Everybody you know is crazy about it.' "'Everybody I know,' echoed Montague. "'What have they to do with it?' "'Why, you've stabbed them in the back,' half-shouted Oliver. "'I could hardly believe my ears when they told me. "'Robbie Walling is simply wild. 
I never had such a time in my life. I don't understand yet, said Montague, more and more amazed. What has he to do with it? Why, man, cried Oliver, his brother's a director in the Fidelity, and his own interests, and all the other companies. You've struck at the whole insurance business. Montague caught his breath. Oh, I see, he said. How could you think of such a thing, cried the other wildly. You promised to consult me about things. I told you when I took this case, put in Montague quickly. I know, said his brother, but you didn't explain. And what did I know about it? I thought I could leave it to your common sense not to mix up in a thing like this. I'm very sorry, said Montague gravely. I had no idea of any such result. That's what I told Robbie, said Oliver. Good God, what a time I had. He took his hat and coat and laid them on the bed and sat down and began to tell about it. I made him realize the disadvantage you were under, he said, being a stranger and not knowing the ground. I believe he had an idea that you tried to get his confidence on purpose to attack him. It was Mrs. Robbie, I guess. You know her fortune is all in that quarter. Oliver wiped the perspiration from his forehead. My, he said, and fancy, what old Wyman must be saying about this, and what a time poor Betty must be having. And then Freddy Van Dam. The air will be blue for half mile round his place. I must send him a wire and explain that it was a mistake, and that we're getting out of it. And he got up to suit the action to the word. But halfway to the desk he heard his brother say, Wait. He turned and saw Montague quite pale. I suppose by getting out of it, said the latter, you mean dropping the case? Of course, was the answer. Well, then, he continued very gravely, I can see that it's going to be hard, and I'm sorry. But you might as well understand me at the very beginning. I will never drop this case. Oliver's jaw fell limp. Alan, he gasped. There was a silence, and then the storm broke. Oliver knew his brother well enough to realize just how thoroughly he meant what he said. And so he got the full force of the shock all at once. He raved and swore and wrung his hands, and declaimed at his brother, saying that he had betrayed him, that he was ruining him, dumping himself and the whole family into the ditch. They would be jeered at and insulted. They would be blacklisted and thrown out of society. Alice's career would be cut short. Every door would be closed to her. His own career would die before it was born. He would never get into the clubs. He would be a pariah. He would be bankrupted and penniless. Again and again Oliver went over the situation, naming person after person who would be outraged, and describing what that person would do. There were the Wallings and the Venables and the Havens and the Van Dams and the Todds and the Wymans. They were all one regiment, and Montague had flung a bomb into the center of them. It was very terrible to him to see his brother's rage and despair, but he had seen his way clear through this matter, and he knew that there was no turning back for him. It is painful to learn that all one's acquaintances are thieves, he said, but that does not change my opinion of stealing. But my God, cried Oliver, did you come to New York to preach sermons? To which the other answered, I came to practice law, and the lawyer who will not fight injustice is a traitor to his profession. Oliver threw up his hands in despair. What could one say to a sentiment such as that? But then again he came to the charge, pointing out to his brother the position in which he had placed himself with the Wallings. He had accepted their hospitality. They had taken him and Alice in, and done everything in the world for them, things for which no money could ever repay them. And now he had struck them. But the only effect of that was to make Montague regret that he had ever anything to do with the Wallings. If they expected to use their friendship to tie his hands in such a matter, they were people he would have left alone. But do you realize that it's not merely yourself you're ruining, cried Oliver. 
Do you know what you're doing for Alice? That is harder yet for me, the other replied. But I am sure that Alice will not ask me to stop. Montague was firmly set in his own mind, but it seemed to be quite impossible for his brother to realize that this was the case. He would give up, but then, going back into his own mind, and facing the thought of this person and that, and the impossibility of the situation which would arise, he would return to the attack with new anguish in his voice. He implored and scolded, and even wept, and then he would get himself together again and come and sit in front of his brother and try to reason with him. And so it was that in the small hours of the morning, Montague, pale and nervous, but quite unshaken, was sitting and listening while his brother unfolded before him a picture of the metropolis as he had come to see it. It was a city ruled by mighty forces, money forces, great families and fortunes, which had held their sway for generations, and regarded the place, with all its swarming millions, as their birthright. They had possessed it utterly. They held it in the hollow of their hands. Railroads and telegraphs and telephones, banks and insurance and trust companies, all these they owned, and the political machines and the legislatures and the courts and the newspapers, the churches and the colleges, and their rule was for plunder. All the streams of profit ran into their coffers. The stranger who came to their city succeeded as he helped them in their purpose, and failed if they could not use him. A great editor or bishop was a man who taught their doctrines. A great statesman was a man who made the laws for them. A great lawyer was one who helped them to outwit the public. Any man who dared to oppose them, they would cast out and trample on. They would slander and ridicule and ruin. And Oliver came down to particulars. He named these powerful men, one after one, and showed what they could do. If his brother would only be a man of the world and see the thing. Look at all the successful lawyers. Oliver named them, one after one. Shrewd devisers of corporation trickery with incomes of hundreds of thousands a year. He could not name the men who had refused to play the game, for no one had ever heard of them. But it was so evident what would happen in this case. His friends would cast him off, his own client would get his price, whatever it was, and then leave him in the lurch and laugh at him. If you can't make up your mind to play the game, cried Oliver frantically, at least you can give it up. There are plenty of other ways of getting a living. If you'll let me, I'll take care of you myself. Rather than have you disgrace me, tell me, will you do that? Will you quit altogether? And Montague suddenly leaped to his feet and brought his fist down upon the desk with a bang. No, he cried, by God, no. Let me make you understand me once and for all, he rushed on. You've shown me New York as you see it. I don't believe it's the truth. I don't believe it for one single moment. But let me tell you this. I shall stay here and find out, and if it is true, it won't stop me. I shall stay here and defy those people. I shall stay and fight them till the day I die. They may ruin me. I'll go live in a garret if I have to. But as sure as there's a God that made me, I'll never stop till I've opened the eyes of the people to what they're doing. Montague towered over his brother, white-hot and terrible. Oliver shrank from him. He had never seen such a burst of wrath from him before. "'Do you understand me now?' Montague cried, and he answered in a despairing voice. "'Yes, yes.' "'I see it's all up,' he added weakly. "'You and I can't pull together.' "'No,' exclaimed the other. "'Passionately, we can't. "'And we might as well give up trying.' You have chosen to be a time-server and a lick-spittle, and I don't choose it. Do you think I've learned nothing in the time I've been here? Why, man, you used to be daring and clever, and now you never draw a breath without wondering if these rich snobs will like the way you do it, and you want Alice to sell herself to them, and you want me to sell my career to them. There was a long pause. 
Oliver had turned very pale. And then suddenly his brother caught himself together and said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to quarrel, but you've goaded me too much. I'm grateful for what you have tried to do for me, and I'll pay you back as soon as I can. But I can't go on with this game. I'll quit, and you can disown me to your friends and tell them that I've run amuck and to forget they ever knew me. They'll hardly blame you for it. They know you too well for that. And as for Alice, I'll talk it out with her tomorrow, and let her decide for herself. If she wants to be a society queen, she can put herself in your hands, and I'll get out of her way. On the other hand, if she approves of what I'm doing, why, we'll both quit, and you won't have to bother with either of us. That was the basis upon which they parted for the night. But like most resolutions taken at white heat, it was not followed literally. It was very hard for Montague to have to confront Alice with such a choice. And as for Oliver, when he went home and thought it over, he began to discover gleams of hope. He might make it clear to everyone that he was not responsible for his brother's business vagaries, and take his chances upon that basis. After all, there were wheels within wheels in society, and if the Robbie Wallings chose to break with him, why, they had plenty of enemies. There might even be interests which would be benefited by Allen's course and would take him up. Montague had resolved to write and break every engagement which he had made, and to sever his connection with society at one stroke. But the next day his brother came again with compromises and new protestations. There was no use going to the other extreme. He, Oliver, would have it out with the Wallings, and they might all go on their way as if nothing had happened. So Montague made his debut in the role of knight-errant. He went with many qualms and misgivings, uncertain how each new person would take it. The next evening he was promised for a theater party with Siegfried Harvey and they had supper in a private room at Delmonico's, and there came Mrs. Winnie, resplendent as an apple tree in early April, and murmuring with bated breath, Oh, you dreadful man, what have you been doing? Have I been poaching on your preserves? he asked promptly. No, not mine, she said, but, and then she hesitated. On Mr. Duval's, he asked. No, she said, not his, but everybody else's. He was telling me about it today, and there's a most dreadful uproar. He wanted me to try to find out what you were up to, and who was behind it. Montague listened wonderingly. Did Mrs. Winnie mean to imply that her husband had asked her to try to worm his business secrets out of him? That was what she seemed to imply. I told him I never talked business with my friends, she said. He can ask you himself if he chooses. But what does it all mean, anyhow? Montague smiled at the naive inconsistency. It means nothing, said he, except that I'm trying to get justice for a client. But can you afford to make so many powerful enemies, she asked. I've taken my chances on that, he replied. Mrs. Winnie answered nothing, but looked at him with wondering admiration in her eyes. You are different from the men about you, she remarked after a while, and her tone gave Montague to understand that there was one person who meant to stand by him. But Mrs. Winnie Duval was not all society. Montague was amused to notice with what suddenness the stream of invitations slacked up. It was necessary for Alice to give her calling list many revisions. Freddy Van Dam had promised to invite them to his place on Long Island, and of course that invitation would never come. Likewise, they would never again see the palace of the Lester Todds upon the Jersey mountaintop. Oliver put in the next few days in calling upon people to explain his embarrassing situation. He washed his hands of his brother's affairs, he said, and his friends might do the same if they saw fit. With the Robbie Wallings he had a stormy half-hour about which he thought it best to say little to the rest of the family. Robbie 
did not break with him utterly, because of their Wall Street alliance. But Mrs. Robbie's feelings were so bitter, he said, that it would be best if Alice saw nothing of her for a while. He had a long talk with Alice and explained the situation. The girl was utterly dumbfounded, for she was deeply grateful to Mrs. Robbie, and fond of her as well, and she could not believe that a friend could be so cruelly unjust to her. The upshot of the whole situation was a very painful episode. A few days later, Alice met Mrs. Robbie at a reception, and she took the lady aside and tried to tell her how distressed and helpless she was. And the result was that Mrs. Robbie flew into a passion and railed at her, declaring in the presence of several people that she had sponged upon her and abused her hospitality. And so poor Alice came home, weeping and half hysterical. All of which, of course, was like oil upon a fire. The heavens were lighted up with a conflagration. The next development was a paragraph in Society's scandal sheet, telling with infinite gusto how a certain ultra-fashionable matron had taken up a family of stranded waifs from as far as state, and introduced them into the best circles, and even gone so far as to give a magnificent dance in their honor, and how the discovery had been made that the head of the family had been secretly preparing an attack upon their business interests, and of the tearing of hair and gnashing of teeth which had followed, and the violent quarrel in a public place, the paragraph concluded with a prediction that the strangers would find themselves the center of a merry social war. Oliver was the first to show them this paper, but least by any chance they should miss it, half a dozen unknown friends were good enough to mail them copies, carefully marked. And then came Reggie Mann, who as freelance and gossip gatherer sat on the fence and watched the fun. Reggie wore a thin veil of sympathy over his naked glee, and brought them the latest reports from all portions of the battleground. Thus they were able to know exactly what everybody was saying about them, who was amused and who was outraged, and who proposed to drop them and who to take them up. Montague listened for a while, but then he got tired of it, and went for a walk to escape it, but only to run into another trap. It was dark, and he was strolling down the avenue, when out of a brilliantly lighted jewelry shop came Mrs. Billy Alden to her carriage, and she hailed him with an exclamation. "'You man!' she cried. "'What have you been doing?' He tried to laugh it off and escape, but she took him by the arm, commanding, "'Get in here and tell me about it.' So he found himself moving with the slow stream of vehicles on the avenue, with Mrs. Billy gazing at him quizzically, and asking him if he did not feel like a hippopotamus in a frog-pond. He replied to her raillery by asking her under which flag she stood. But there was little need to ask that, for anyone who was fighting a walling became ipso facto a friend of Mrs. Billy's. She told Montague that if he felt his social position was imperiled, all he had to do was to come to her. She would gird on her armor and take the field. "'But tell me how you came to do it,' she said. He answered that there was very little to tell. He had taken up a case which was obviously just, but having no idea what a storm it would raise. Then he noticed that his companion was looking at him sharply. "'Do you really mean that's all there is to it?' she asked. "'Of course I do,' said he, perplexed. "'Do you know,' was her unexpected response, "'I hardly know what to make of you. I'm afraid to trust you on account of your brother." Montague was embarrassed. "'I don't know what you mean,' he said. "'Everybody thinks there's some trickery in that suit,' she answered. "'Oh,' said Montague, "'I see. Well, they will find out. If it will help you any to know it, I've been having no end of scenes with my brother.' "'I believe you,' said Mrs. Billy, genially. "'But it seems strange that a man could have been so blind to the situation. I feel quite ashamed, because I didn't help you myself." The carriage had stopped at Mrs. Billy's home, and she asked him to dinner. 
there'll be nobody but my brother she said we're resting this evening and i can make up to you for my negligence montague had no engagement and so he went in and saw mrs billy's mansion which was decorated in imitation of a doge's palace and met mr davy alden a mild-mannered little gentleman who obeyed orders promptly they had a comfortable dinner of a half a dozen courses and then retired to the drawing-room where mrs billy sank into a huge easy chair with a decanter of whiskey and some cracked ice in readiness beside it then from a tray she selected a thick black cigar and placidly bit off the end and lighted it and then settled back at her ease and proceeded to tell montague about new york and about the great families who ruled it and where and how they had got their money and who were their allies and who their enemies and what particular skeletons were hidden in each of their closets it was worth coming a long way to listen to mrs billy's tete -tete. her thoughts were vigorous and her imagery was picturesque she spoke of old dan waterman and described him as a wild boar rooting chestnuts he was all right she said if you didn't come under his tree and montague asked which is his tree and she answered any one he happens to be under at the time and then she came to the wallings mrs billy had been on the inside of that family and there was nothing she didn't know about it and she brought the members up one by one and dissected them and exhibited them for montague's benefit they were typical bourgeois people she said they were burghers they had never shown the least capacity for refinement they ate and drank and jostled other people out of the way the old ones had been boars and the new ones were cads and mrs billy sat and puffed at her cigar do you know the history of the family she asked the founder was a rough old ferryman he fought his rivals so well that in the end he owned all the boats and then someone discovered the idea of buying legislatures and building railroads and he went into that it was a time when they simply grabbed things if you ever look into it you'll find they're making fortunes today out of privileges that old man simply sat down on and held there's a bridge at albany for instance to which they haven't the slightest right my brother knows about it they've given themselves a contract with their railroad by which they're paid for every passenger and their profit every year is greater than the cost of the bridge the son was the head of the family when i came in and i found that he had it all arranged to leave thirty million dollars to one of his sons and only ten million to my husband i set to work to change that i can tell you i used to go round to see him and scratch his back and tickle him and make him feel good of course the family went wild my how they hated me they settled ellis to work to keep me off have you met judge ellis i have said montague well there's a pussy-footed old hypocrite for you said mrs billy in those days he was walling's business lackey he used to pass the money to the legislatures and keep the wheels of the machine greased one of the first things i said to the old man was that i didn't ask him to entertain my butler and he mustn't ask me to entertain his valet so i forbid ellis to enter my house and when i found that he was trying to get between the old man and me i flew into a rage and boxed his ears and chased him out of the room mrs billy paused and laughed heartily over the recollection of course that tickled the old man to death she continued the wallings never could make out how i managed to get round him as i did but it was simply because i was honest with him they'd come sniveling round pretending they were anxious about his health while well, i wanted his money and i told him so the valiant lady turned to the decanter have some scotch she asked and poured some for herself and then went on with her story when i first came to new york she said the rich people's houses were all alike all dreary brownstone fronts sandwiched in on one or two city lots i vowed that i would have a house with some room around it 
and that was the beginning of those palaces that all New York walks by and stares at. You can hardly believe it now. Those houses were a scandal. But the sensation tickled the old man. I remember one day we walked up the avenue to see how they were coming on, and he pointed with his big stick to the second floor and asked, What's that? I answered, It's a safe I'm building into the house. That was a new thing, too, in those days. I'm going to keep my money in that, I said. Bah, he growled. When you're done with this house, you won't have any money left. I'm planning to make you fill it for me, I answered. And do you know, he chuckled all the way home over it. Mrs. Billy sat laughing softly to herself. We had great old battles in those days, she said. Among other things, I had to put the Wallings into society. They were sneaking round on the outside when I came, licking other people's boots and expecting to be kicked. I said to myself, I'll put an end to that. We'll have a showdown. So I gave a ball that made the whole country sit up and gasp. It wouldn't be noticed particularly nowadays, but then people had never dreamed of anything so gorgeous. And I made out a list of all the people I wanted to know in New York. And I said to myself, if you come, you're a friend, and if you don't, you're an enemy. And they all came, let me tell you. And there was never any question about the Wallings being in society after that. Mrs. Billy halted, and Montague remarked with a smile that doubtless she was sorry now that she had done it. Oh, no, she answered with a shrug of her shoulders. I find that all I have to do is to be patient. I hate people and think I like to poison them. But if I only wait long enough, something happens to them much worse than I ever dreamed of. You'll be revenged on the Robbies some day. I don't want any revenge, Montague answered. I've no quarrel with them. I simply wish I hadn't accepted their hospitality. I didn't know they were such little people. It seems hard to believe it. Mrs. Billy laughed cynically. What could you expect, she said. They know there's nothing to them but their money. When that's gone, they're gone. They could never make any more. The lady gave a chuckle and added, Those words make me think of Davy's experience when he wanted to go to Congress. Tell him about it, Davy. But Mr. Alden did not warm to the subject. He left the tale to his sister. He was a Democrat, you know, said she, and he went to the boss and told him he'd like to go to Congress. The answer was that it would cost him $40,000, and he kicked at the price. Others didn't have to put up such sums, he said. Why should he? And the old man growled at him. The rest have other things to give. One can deliver the letter carriers. Another is paid for by a corporation. But what can you do? What is there to you but your money? So Davy paid the money, didn't you, Davy? And Davy grinned sheepishly. Even so, she went on, he came off better than poor Devon. They got fifty thousand out of him and sold him out, and he never got to Congress after all. That was just before he concluded that America wasn't a fit place for a gentleman to live in. And so Mrs. Billy got started on the Devons, and after that came the Havens and the Wymans and the Todds. It was midnight before she got through with them all. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Metropolis by Upton Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The newspaper said nothing more about the Hasbrook suit, but in financial circles Montague had attained considerable notoriety because of it, and this was the means of bringing him a number of new cases. But alas, there were no more $50,000 clients. The first caller was a destitute widow with a deed which would have entitled her to the greater part of a large city in Pennsylvania. Only, unfortunately, the deed was about eighty years old. And then there was a poor old man who had been hurt in a streetcar accident and had been tricked into signing away his rights. 
and an indignant citizen who proposed to bring a hundred suits against the Traction Trust for transfers refused. All were contingency cases, with the chances of success exceedingly remote, and Montague noticed that the people had come to him as a last resort, having apparently heard of him as a man of altruistic temper. There was one case which interested him particularly, because it seemed to fit in so ominously with the grim prognosis of his brother. He received a call from an elderly gentleman, of very evident refinement and dignity of manner, who proceeded to unfold to him a most amazing story. Five or six years ago he had invented a storage battery, which was the most efficient known. He had organized a company with three million dollars capital to manufacture it, himself taking a third interest for his patents, and becoming president of the company. Not long afterward had come a proposal from a group of men who wished to organize a company to manufacture automobiles. They proposed to form an alliance which would give them the exclusive use of the battery. But these men were not people with whom the inventor cared to deal. They were traction and gas magnets, widely known for their unscrupulous methods. And so he had declined their offer, and set to work instead to organize an automobile company himself. He had just got under way when he discovered that his rivals had set to work to take his invention away from him. A friend, who owned another third share in his company, had hypothecated his stock to help form the new company, and now came a call from the bank for more collateral, and he was obliged to sell out. And at the next stockholders' meeting it developed that their rivals had bought it and likewise more stock in the open market, and they proceeded to take possession of the company, ousting the former president, and then making a contract with their automobile company to furnish the storage battery at a price which left no profit for the manufacturers. And so for two years the inventor had not received a dollar of dividends upon his million dollars' worth of paper, and to cap the climax, the company had refused to sell the battery to his automobile company, and so that he had gone into bankruptcy and his friends were ruined also. Montague went into the case very carefully and found that the story was true. What interested him particularly in it was the fact that he had met a couple of these financial highwaymen in social life. He had come to know the son and heir of one of them quite well at Siegfried Harvey's. This gilded youth was engaged to be married in a very few days, and the papers had it that the father-in-law had presented the bride with a check for a million dollars. Montague could not but wonder if it was the million that had been taken from his client. There was to be a bachelor dinner at the millionaire's on the night before the wedding, to which he and Oliver had been invited. As he was thinking of taking up his case, he went to his brother, saying he wished to decline. But Oliver had been getting back his courage day by day, and declared that it was more important than ever now that he should hold his ground and face his enemies, for Alice's sake, if not for his own. And so Montague went to the dinner, and saw deeper yet into the history of the stolen millions. It was a very beautiful affair in the beginning. There was a large private dining room, elaborately decorated, with a string orchestra concealed in a bower of plants. But there were cocktails even on the sideboard at the doorway, and by the time the guests had got to the coffee, everyone was hilariously drunk. After each toast, they would hurl their glasses over their shoulders. The purpose of a bachelor dinner, it appeared, was a farewell to the old days and the boon companions, so there were sentimental and comic songs which had been composed for the occasion, and were received with whirlwinds of laughter. By listening closely and reading between the lines, one might get quite a history of the young host's adventurous career. There was a house up on the west side, and there was a yacht with orgies in every part of the world. 
There was the summer night in Newport Harbor when someone had hit upon the dazzling scheme of freezing twenty-dollar gold pieces in tiny blocks of ice to be dropped down the girls' backs. And there was a banquet in a studio in New York when a huge pie had been brought on, and from which a half-nude girl had emerged, with a flock of canary birds about her. Then there was a damsel who had been wont to dance upon the tops of supper tables, clad in diaphanous costume, and who had got drunk after a theater party and set out to smash up a Broadway restaurant. There was a cousin from Chicago, a wild lad, who made a specialty of this diversion, and whose mistresses were bathed in champagne. Apparently, there were numberless places in the city where such orgies were carried on continually. There were private clubs and artists' studios. There were several allusions to a high tower, which Montague did not comprehend. Many such matters, however, were explained to him by an elderly gentleman who sat on his right and who seemed to stay sober, no matter how much he drank. Incidentally, he gravely advised Montague to meet one of the young host's mistresses, who was a stunning girl and was in the market. Towards morning the festivities changed to a series of wrestling bouts. The young men stripped off their clothing and tore the table to pieces, and piled it out of the way in a corner, smashing most of the crockery in the process. Between the matches, champagne would be opened by knocking off the heads of the bottles, and this went on until four o'clock in the morning, when many of the guests were lying in heaps upon the floor. Montague rode home in a cab with the elderly gentleman who had sat next to him, and on the way he asked if such affairs as this were common, and his companion, who was a steel man from the West, replied by telling him of some which he had witnessed at home. At Siegfried Harvey's theatre party, Montague had seen a popular actress in a musical comedy, which was then the most successful play running in New York. The house was sold out weeks ahead, and after the matinee you might observe the street in front of the stage entrance blocked by people waiting to see the woman come out. She was lithe and supple, like a panther, and wore close-fitting gowns to reveal her form. It seemed that her play must have been built with one purpose in mind, to see how much lewdness could be put upon a stage without interference by the police. And now his companion told him how this woman had been invited to sing at a banquet given by magnates of a mighty trust, and had gone after midnight to the most exclusive club in the town, and sung her popular ditty, Won't you come and play with me? The merry magnates had taken the invitation literally, with the result that the actress had escaped from the room with half her clothing torn off her. A little while later, an official of his trust had wished to get rid of his wife and marry a chorus girl, and when public clamor had forced the directors to ask him to resign, he had replied by threatening to tell about this banquet. The next day, or rather, to be precise, that same morning, Montague and Alice attended the gorgeous wedding. It was declared by the newspapers to be the most important social event of the week and it took half a dozen policemen to hold back the crowds which filled the street. The ceremony took place at St. Cecilia's, with the stately bishop officiating in his purple and scarlet robes. Inside the doors were all the elect, exquisitely groomed and gowned, and such a medley of delicious perfumes as not all the veils in Arcady could equal. The groom had been polished and scrubbed, and looked very handsome, though somewhat pale, and Montague could not but smile as he observed the best man looking so very solemn, and recollected the drunken wrestler of a few hours before, staggering about in a pale blue undershirt ripped up the back. The Montagues knew by this time whom they were to avoid. They were graciously taken under the wing of Mrs. Eldridge Devon, whose real estate was not affected by insurance suits. And the next morning they had the satisfaction of seeing their names in a list of those present, 
and even a couple of lines about Alice's costume. Alice was always referred to as Miss Montague. It was very pleasant to be the Miss Montague, and to think of all the other would-be Miss Montagues in the city who were thereby haughtily rebuked. In the yellow papers there was also accounts of the trousseau of the bride, and the wonderful gifts which she had received, and of the long honeymoon which she was to spend in the Mediterranean upon her husband's yacht. Montague found himself wondering if the ghosts of its former occupants would not haunt her, and whether she would have been as happy had she known as much as he knew. He found food for a good deal of thought in the memory of this banquet. Among the things which he had gathered from the songs was a hint that Oliver, also, had some secrets which he had not seen fit to tell his brother. The keeping of young girls was apparently one of the established customs of the little brothers of the rich, and, for that matter, many of the big brothers also. A little later Montague had a curious glimpse into the life of this half-world. He had occasion, on one evening, to call upon a certain financier, who he had come to know quite well, a man, a family, and a member of the church. There were some important papers to be signed and sent off by a steamer, and the great man's secretary said that he would try to find him. A minute or two later he called up Montague and asked him if he would be good enough to go to an address uptown. It was a house not far from Riverside Drive, and Montague went up there and found his acquaintance with several other prominent men of affairs whom he knew, conversing in a drawing-room with one of the most charming ladies he had ever met. She was exquisite to look at, and one of the few people in New York whom he had found worth listening to. He spent such an enjoyable evening that when he was leaving he remarked to the lady that he would like his cousin Alice to meet her, and then he noticed that she flushed slightly and was embarrassed. Later on he learned to his dismay that the charming and beautiful lady did not go into society. Nor was this at all rare. On the contrary, if one took the trouble to make inquiries, he would find that such establishments were everywhere taken for granted. Montague talked about it with Major Venable, and out of his gossip storehouse the old gentleman drew forth a string of antidotes that made one's hair stand on end. There was one all-powerful magnate, who had a passion for the wife of a great physician, and had given a million dollars or so to build a hospital and had provided that it should be the finest in the world, and that this physician should go abroad for three years to study the institutions of Europe. No conventions counted with this old man. If he saw a woman whom he wanted, he would ask for her, and women in society felt that it was an honor to be his mistress. Not long after this, a man, who voiced the anguish of a mighty nation, was turned out of several hotels in New York because he was not married according to the laws of South Dakota. But this other man would take a woman to any hotel in the city, and no one would dare oppose him. And there was another, a great traction king, who kept mistresses in Chicago and Paris and London, as well as in New York, and he had one just around the corner from his palatial home and had an underground passage leading to it. And the Major told with glee how he had shown this to a friend, and the latter had remarked, I'm too stout to get through there. I know it, replied the other, else I shouldn't have told you. And so it went. One of the richest men in New York was a sexual degenerate, with a half a dozen women on his hands all the time. He would send them checks, and they would use these to blackmail him. This man's young wife had been shut up in a closet for twenty-four hours by her mother, to compel her to marry him. And then there was the charming tale of how he had gone away upon a mission of state, and had written long messages full of tender protestations, and had given them to a newspaper correspondent to cable home to his wife. 
The correspondent thought it such a touching example of conjugal devotion that he told about it at a dinner party when he came back, and was struck by the sudden silence that fell. The messages had been sent to a code address, chuckled the major, and every one at the table knew who had got them. A few days after this, Montague received a telephone message from Siegfried Harvey, who said he wanted to see him about a matter of business. He asked him to lunch at the Noonday Club, and Montague went, though not without a qualm, for it was in the Fidelity Building, the enemy's bailiwick, a magnificent structure with halls of white marble and a lavish display of bronze. It occurred to Montague that somewhere in this structure people were at work preparing an answer to his charges. He wondered what they were saying. The two had lunch, talking meanwhile about the coming events in society, and about politics and wars, and when the coffee was served, and they were alone in the room, Harvey settled his big frame back in a chair and began. In the first place, he said, I must explain that I have something to say that is devilish hard to get into. I'm so much afraid of your jumping to the wrong conclusion in the middle of it. I'd like you to agree to listen for a minute or two before you think at all. All right, said Montague with a smile. Fire away. And at once the other became grave. You've taken a case against this company, he said, and Ollie has talked enough to me to make me understand that you've done a plucky thing and that you must be everlastingly sick of hearing from cowardly people who want you to drop it. I'd be very sorry to be classed with them, for even a moment, and you must understand at the outset that I haven't a particle of interest in the company, and that it wouldn't matter to me if I had. I don't try to use my friends in business, and I don't let money count with me in my social life. I made up my mind to take the risk of speaking to you about this case simply because I happen to know one or two things about it that I thought you didn't know. And if that's so, you are at a great disadvantage. But in any case, please understand that I have no motive but friendship. And so if I am butting in, excuse me. When Siegfried Harvey talked, he looked straight at one with his clear blue eyes and there was no doubting his honesty. "'I am very much obliged to you,' said Montague. "'Pray tell me what you have to say.' "'All right,' said the other. "'It can be done very quickly. "'You have taken a case which involves a great many sacrifices upon your part, "'and I wondered if it had ever occurred to you to ask "'whether you might not be taken advantage of.' "'How do you mean?' asked Montague. Do you know the people who are behind you? inquired the other. Do you know them well enough to be sure? What are their motives in the case? Montague hesitated and thought. No, he said, I couldn't say that I do. Then it's just as I thought, replied Harvey. I've been watching you. You are an honest man, and you're putting yourself to no end of trouble for the best of motives. And unless I'm mistaken, you're being used by men who are not honest, and whom you wouldn't work with if you knew their purposes. What purposes could they have? There are several possibilities. In the first place, it might be a strike suit. Somebody who is hoping to be bought off for a big price. That's what nearly everyone thinks is the case. But I don't. I think it's more likely someone within the company who is trying to put the administration in a hole. "'Who could that be?' exclaimed Montague, amazed. "'I don't know that. I'm not familiar enough with the situation in Fidelity. It's changing all the time. I simply know that there are factions struggling for control of it, and hating each other furiously, and ready to do anything in the world to cripple each other. You know that there are forty millions of surplus gives an enormous power. I'd rather be able to swing forty millions in the street than to have ten millions in my own right. And so the giants are fighting for control of those companies. And if you can't tell who's in and who's out, you can never know the real meaning of anything that happens in the struggle. 
all that you can be sure of is that the game is crooked from end to end and that nothing that happens in it is what it pretends to be montague listened half dazed and feeling as if the ground he stood on were caving beneath his feet what do you know about those who brought you this case asked his companion suddenly not much he said weakly harvey hesitated a moment understand me please he said i've no wish to pry into your affairs and if you don't care to say any more i'll understand it perfectly but i've heard it said that the man who started the thing was ellis montague in his turn hesitated then he said that is correct between you and me very good said harvey and that is what made me suspicious do you know anything about ellis i didn't said the other i've heard a little since i can fancy so said harvey and i can tell you that ellis is mixed up in life insurance matters in all sorts of dubious ways it seems to me that you have reason to be more careful where you follow him montague sat with his hands clenched and his brows knitted his friend's talk had been like a flash of lightning it revealed huge menacing forms in the darkness about him all the structure of his hopes seemed to be tottering his case that he had worked so hard over his fifty thousand dollars that he had been so proud of could it be that he had been tricked and had made a fool of himself how in the world am i to know he cried that is more than i can tell said his friend and for that matter i'm not sure that you could do anything now all that i could do was to warn you what sort of ground you were treading on so that you could watch out for yourself in future montague thanked him heartily for that service and then he went back to his office and spent the rest of the day pondering the matter what he had heard had made a vast change in things before it everything had seemed simple and now nothing was clear he was overwhelmed with a sense of utter futility of his efforts he was trying to build a house upon quicksands there was nowhere a solid spot upon which he could set his foot there was nowhere any truth there were only contending powers who used the phrases of truth for their own purposes and now he saw himself as the world saw him a party to a piece of trickery a knave like all the rest he felt that he had been tripped up at the first step in his career the conclusion of the whole matter was that he took an afternoon train for albany and the next morning he talked the matter out with the judge montague had realized the need of going slowly for after all he had no definite ground for suspicion and so very tactfully and cautiously he explained that it had come to his ears that many people believed that there were interested parties behind the suit of mr hasbrook and that this had made him uncomfortable as he knew nothing whatever about his client he had come to ask the judge's advice in the matter no one could have taken the thing more graciously than did the great man he was all kindness and tact in the first place he said he had warned him in advance that enemies would attack him and slander him and that all kinds of subtle means would be used to influence him and he must understand that these rumors were part of such a campaign it made no difference how good a friend had brought them to him how could he know who had brought them to that friend the judge ventured to hope that nothing that anyone might say could influence him to believe that he the judge would have advised him to do anything improper no said montague but can you assure me that there are no interested parties behind mr hasbrook interested parties asked the other i mean people connected with the fidelity or other insurance companies why oh, no said the judge i certainly couldn't assure you of that montague looked surprised you mean you don't know i mean was the answer that i wouldn't feel at liberty to tell even if i did know and montague stared at him he had not been prepared for this frankness it never occurred to me the other continued that that was a matter 
which could make any difference to you. Why, began Montague. Pray understand me, Mr. Montague, said the judge. It seemed to me that this was obviously a just case, and it seemed so to you. And the only other matter that I thought you might have a right to be assured of was that it was seriously meant. Of that I felt assured. It did not seem to me of any importance that there might be interested individuals behind Mr. Hasbrook. Let us suppose, for instance, that there were some parties who had been offended by the administration of the fidelity, and were anxious to punish it. Could a lawyer be justified in refusing to take a just case simply because he knew of such private motives? Or let us assume an extreme case, a factional fight within the company, as you say, has been suggested to you. Well, that would be a case of thieves falling out. And is there any reason why the public should not reap the advantage of such a situation? The men inside the company are the ones who would know first what is going on. And if you saw a chance to use such an advantage in a just fight, would you not do it? So the judge went on, gracious and plausible, and so subtly and exquisitely corrupting. Underneath his smoothly flowing sentences, Montague could feel the presence of one fundamental thought. It was unuttered and even unhinted, but it pervaded the judge's discourse as a mood pervades a melody. The young lawyer had got a big fee, and he had a nice easy case, and as a man of the world, he could not really wish to pry into it too closely. He had heard gossip, and had felt that his reputation required him to be disturbed. But he had come simply to be smoothed down the back and made at ease, and enabled to keep his fee without losing his good opinion of himself. Montague quit, because he concluded that it was not worth while to try to make himself understood. After all, he was in the case now, and there was nothing to be gained by a breach. Two things he felt he had made certain by the interview. First, that his client was a dummy, and that it was really a case of thieves falling out. And second, that he had no guarantee that he might not be left in the lurch at any moment, except the touching confidence of the judge in some parties unknown. End of chapter 18《Chapter Nineteen of the Metropolis by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Montague came home with his mind made up that there was nothing he could do except to be more careful next time. For this mistake, he would have to pay the price. He had still to learn what the full price was. The day after his return, there came a caller. Mr. John C. Burton read his card. He proved to be a canvassing agent for the company which published the scandal sheet of society. They were preparing a deluxe account of the prominent families of New York, a very sumptuous affair with a highly exclusive set of subscribers, at the rate of fifteen hundred dollars per set. Would Mr. Montague, by any chance, care to have his family included? And Mr. Montague explained politely, that he was a comparative stranger in New York, and would not belong properly in such a volume. But the agent was not satisfied with this. There might be reasons for his subscribing. Even so, there might be special cases. Mr. Montague, as a stranger, might not realize the important nature of the offer. After he had consulted his friends, he might change his mind, and so on. As Montague listened, to this series of broad hints, and took in the meaning of them, the color mounted to his cheeks, until at last he rose abruptly and bid the man good afternoon. But then, as he sat alone, his anger died away, and there was left only discomfort and uneasiness. And three or four days later, he bought another issue of the paper, and sure enough, there was a new paragraph. He stood on the street corner reading it, the social war was raging hotly, it said, and added that Mrs. de Graffin Reed was threatening to take up the cause of the strangers. 
Then it went on to picture a certain exquisite young man of fashion who was rushing about among his friends to apologize for his brother's indiscretions. Also, it said, there was a brilliant social queen, wife of a great banker, who had taken up the cudgels. And then came three sentences more, which made the blood leap like a flame into Montague's cheeks. There have not been lacking comments upon her suspicious ardor. It has been noticed that since the advent of the romantic-looking Southerner, this restless lady's interest in the Babists and the transmediums has waned, and now society is watching for the denouement of a most interesting situation. To Montague these words came like a blow in the face. He went down the street half-dazed. It seemed to him the blackest shame that New York had yet shown him. He clenched his fists as he walked, whispering to himself, The scoundrels! He realized instantly that he was helpless. Down home one would have thrashed the editor of such a paper. But here he was in the wolves' own country, and he could do nothing. He went back to his office and sat down at the desk. My dear Miss Winnie, he wrote, I have just read the enclosed paragraph, and I cannot tell you how profoundly pained I am that your kindness to us should have made you the victim of such an outrage. I am quite helpless in the matter, except to enable you to avoid any further annoyance. Please believe me when I say that we shall all of us understand perfectly if you think we had best not meet again at present, and that this will make no difference whatever in our feelings. This letter Montague sent by a messenger, and then he went home. Perhaps ten minutes after he arrived, the telephone bell rang, and there was Mrs. Winnie. "'Your note has come,' she said. "'Have you an engagement this evening?' "'No,' he answered. "'Well,' she said, "'will you come to dinner?' "'Mrs. Winnie,' he protested. "'Please come,' she said. "'Please. "'I hate to have you,' he began. "'I wish you to come,' she said a third time. "'So he answered, "'Very well.' "'He went, and when he entered the house, "'the butler led him to the elevator, saying, "'Mrs. Duval says, "'Will you please come upstairs, sir?' "'And there Mrs. Winnie met him, "'with flushed cheeks, an eager countenance. She was even lovelier than usual, in a soft cream-colored gown and a crimson rose in her bosom. I am all alone tonight, she said, so we'll dine in my apartments. We'd be lost in that big room downstairs. She led him into her drawing room, where great armfuls of new roses scattered their perfume. There was a table set for two, and two big chairs before the fire which blazed in the heart. Montague noticed that her hand trembled a little, and she motioned him to one of them. He could read her excitement in her whole aspect. She was flinging down the gauntlet to her enemies. "'Let us eat first and talk afterwards,' she said hurriedly. "'We'll be happy for a while, anyway.' And she went on to be happy in her nervous and eager way. She talked about the new opera which was to be given and about Mrs. de Graffenreid's new entertainment, and about Miss Ridgely Clevenden's ball, also about the hospital for crippled children which she wanted to build, and about Mrs. Vivie Packton's rumored divorce. And meantime, the sphinx-like attendants moved here and there, and the dinner came and went. They took their coffee in the big chairs by the fire, and the table was swept clear, and the servants vanished closing the doors behind them. Then Montague set his cup aside and sat gazing somberly into the fire, and Mrs. Winnie watched him. There was a long silence. Suddenly he heard her voice. "'Do you find it so easy to give up our friendship?' she asked. "'I didn't think about it being easy or hard,' he answered. "'I simply thought of protecting you. "'And do you think that my friends are nothing to me?' she demanded. Have I so very many as that? And she clenched her hands with a sudden, passionate gesture. Do you think that I will let those wretches frighten me into doing what they want? I'll not give in to them, not for anything that Layla can do. A look of perplexity crossed Montague's face. Layla, he asked. 
"'Mrs. Robbie Walling,' she cried, "'don't you suppose that she is responsible for that paragraph?' Montague started. "'That's the way they fight their battles,' cried Mrs. Winnie. "'They pay money to those scoundrels to be protected, "'and then they send nasty gossip about people they wish to injure.' "'You don't mean that!' exclaimed the man. "'Of course I do,' cried she. "'I know that it's true. "'I know that Robbie Walling paid fifteen thousand dollars "'for some trumpery volumes that they got out. "'And how do you suppose the paper gets its gossip?' "'I didn't know,' said Montague, "'but I never dreamed.' "'Why?' exclaimed Mrs. Winnie. "'Their mail is full of blue and gold monogram stationery. "'I've known guests to sit down "'and write gossip about their hostesses "'in their own homes. "'Oh, you've no idea of people's vileness.' "'I had some idea,' said Montague, "'after a pause. "'That was why I wished to protect you.' "'I don't wish to be protected,' she cried vehemently. "'I'll not give them the satisfaction. "'They wish to make me give you up, "'and I'll not do it for anything they can say.' "'Montague sat with knitted brows, "'gazing into the fire. "'When I read that paragraph,' he said slowly, "'I could not bear to think of the unhappiness it might cause you. "'I thought of how much it might disturb your husband.' "'My husband?' echoed Mrs. Winnie. "'There was a hard tone in her voice as she went on. He will fix it up with them, she said. That's his way. There will be nothing more published. You can feel sure about that. Montague sat in silence. That was not the reply he had expected, and it rather disconcerted him. If that were all, he said, with hesitation. But I could not know. I thought that the paragraph might disturb him for another reason, that it might be a cause of unhappiness between you and him. There was a pause. "'You don't understand,' said Mrs. Winnie at last. Without turning his head, he could see her hands, as they lay upon her knees. She was moving them nervously. "'You don't understand,' she repeated. When she began to speak again, it was in a low, trembling voice. "'I must tell you,' she said. "'I have felt sure that you did not know.' There was another pause. She hesitated, and her hands trembled. Then suddenly she hurried on. I wanted you to know I do not love my husband. I am not bound to him. He has nothing to say in my affairs. Montague sat rigid, turned to stone. He was half dazed by the words. He could feel Mrs. Winnie's gaze fixed upon him, and he could feel the hot flush that spread over her throat and cheeks. It, it was not fair for you not to know, she whispered and her voice died away. And there was again a silence. Montague was dumb. "'Why don't you say something?' she panted at last, and he caught the note of anguish in her voice. Then he turned and stared at her, and saw her tightly clenched hands and the quiver of her lips. He was shocked quite beyond speech, and he saw her bosom heaving quickly, and saw the tears start into her eyes. Suddenly she sank down and covered her face with her hands and broke into frantic sobbing. "'Mrs. Winnie!' he cried and started to his feet. Her outburst continued. He saw that she was shuddering violently. "'Then you don't love me?' she wailed. He stood trembling and utterly bewildered. "'I'm so sorry,' he whispered. "'Oh, Mrs. Winnie, I had no idea.' "'I know it. I know it,' she cried. "'It's my fault. I was a fool.' I knew it all the time, but I hoped, I thought you might, if you knew. And then again her tears choked her. She was convulsed with pain and grief. Montague stood watching her, helpless with distress. She caught hold of the arm of the chair convulsively, and he put his hand upon hers. Mrs. Winnie, he began. But she jerked her hand away and hid it. No, no, she cried in terror. Don't touch me and suddenly she looked up at him, stretching out her arms. "'Don't you understand that I love you?' she exclaimed. "'You despise me for it, I know, but I can't help it. I will tell you even so. It is the only satisfaction I can have. I have always loved you, and I thought, I thought it was only that you didn't understand. I was ready to brave all the world. 
I didn't care who knew it or what anybody said. I thought we could be happy. I thought I could be free at last. Oh, you've no idea how unhappy I am, and how lonely, and how I long to escape. And I believe that you, that you might. And then the tears gushed into Mrs. Winnie's eyes again, and her voice became the voice of a little child. "'Don't you think you might come to love me?' she wailed. Her voice shook Montague so that he trembled to the depths of him, but his face only became the more grave. "'You despise me because I told you,' she exclaimed. "'No, no, Miss Winnie,' he said. "'I could not possibly do that.' "'Then, then why?' she whispered. "'Why would it be so hard to love me?' "'It would be very easy,' he said, "'but I dare not let myself.' She looked at him piteously. "'You are so cold, so merciless,' she cried. He answered nothing, and she sat trembling. "'Have you ever loved a woman?' she asked. There was a long pause. He sat in the chair again. "'Listen, Mrs. Winnie,' he began at last. "'Don't call me that,' she exclaimed. "'Call me Evelyn, please.' "'Very well,' he said. "'Evelyn, I did not intend to make you unhappy. If I had had any idea, I should never have seen you again. I will tell you what I have never told anybody before. Then you will understand. He sat for a few moments in a somber reverie. Once, he said, when I was young, I loved a woman, a quadroon girl. That was in New Orleans. It was a custom we have there. They have a world of their own, and we take care of them and of the children and everyone knows about it. I was very young, only about eighteen, and she was even younger. But I found out, then, what women are, and what love means to them. I saw how they could suffer. And then she died in childbirth. The child died, too. Montague's voice was very low, and Mrs. Winnie sat with her hands clasped, and her eyes riveted upon his face. I saw her die, he said, and that was all. I have never forgotten it. I made up my mind, then, that I had done wrong, and that never again, while I lived, would I offer my love to a woman, unless I could devote all my life to her. So you see, I'm afraid of love. I do not wish to suffer so much, or to make others suffer. And when anyone speaks to me as you did, it brings it all back to me. It makes me shrink up and wither. He paused, and the other caught her breath. "'Understand me,' she said, her voice trembling. "'I would not ask any pledges of you. I would pay whatever price there was to pay. I am not afraid to suffer.' "'I do not wish you to suffer,' he said. "'I do not wish to take advantage of any woman.' "'But I have nothing in the world that I value,' she cried. "'I would go away. I would give up everything to be with a man like you. I have no ties, no duties.' He interrupted her. You have your husband, he said. And she cried out in sudden fury. My husband? Has no one ever told you about my husband, she asked, after a pause. No one, he said. Well, ask them, she exclaimed. Meantime, take my word for it. I owe nothing to my husband. Montague sat staring into the fire. But consider my own case, he said. I have duties, my mother and my cousin. Oh, don't say any more, cried the woman, with a break in her voice. Say that you don't love me. That is all there is to say. And you will never respect me again. I've been a fool. I've ruined everything. I have flung away your friendship that I might have kept. No, he said. She rushed on vehemently. At least I have been honest. Give me credit for that. That is how all my troubles come. I say what is on my mind and I pay the price for my blunders. It is not as if I were cold and calculating, so don't despise me altogether. I couldn't despise you, said Montague. I am simply pained, because I have made you unhappy, and I did not mean to. Mrs. Winnie sat staring ahead of her in a somber reverie. Don't think any more about it, she said bitterly. I will get over it. I am not worth troubling about. Don't you suppose I know how you feel about this world that I live in? And I'm part of it. 
I beat my wings and try to get out, but I can't. I'm in it, and I'll stay in till I die. I might as well give up. I thought that I could steal a little joy. You have no idea how hungry I am for a little joy. You have no idea how lonely I am, and how empty my life is. You talk about your fear of making me unhappy. It's a grim jest. But I'll give you permission, if you can. I'll ask nothing, no promises, no sacrifices. I'll take all the risks and pay all the penalties. She smiled through her tears, a sardonic smile. He was watching her, and she turned again, and their eyes met. Again, he saw the blood mount from her throat to her cheeks. At the same time came the old stirring of the wild beast within him. He knew that the less time he spent in sympathizing with Mrs. Winnie, the better for both of them. He started to rise, and the words of farewell were on his lips, when suddenly there came a knock upon the door. Mrs. Winnie sprang to her feet. "'Who is that?' she cried. And the door opened, and Mr. Duval entered. "'Good evening,' he said pleasantly, and came toward her. Mrs. Winnie flushed angrily and stared at him. "'Why do you come here unannounced?' she cried. "'I apologize,' he said, "'but I found this in my mail.' And Montague, in the act of rising to greet him, saw that he had the offensive clipping in his hand. Then he saw Duval give a start and realized that the man had not been aware of his presence in the room. Duval gazed from Montague to his wife and noticed for the first time her tears and her agitation. "'I beg pardon,' he said. "'I'm evidently trespassing.' "'You most certainly are,' responded Mrs. Winnie. He made a move to withdraw, but before he could take a step, she had brushed past him and left the room, slamming the door behind her. And Duval stared after her, and then he stared at Montague and laughed. Well, 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 he said. Then, checking his amusement, he added, Good evening, sir. Good evening, said Montague. He was trembling slightly, and Duval noticed it. He smiled genially. This is the sort of material out of which scenes are made, said he, but I beg you not to be embarrassed. We won't have any scenes. Montague could think of nothing to say to that. I owe Evelyn an apology, the other continued. It was entirely an accident. This clipping, you see, I do not intrude as a rule. You may make yourself at home in future. Montague flushed scarlet at the words. Mr. Duval, he said, I have to assure you that you are mistaken. The other stared at him. Oh, come, come, he said, laughing. Let us talk as men of the world. I say that you are mistaken, said Montague again. The other shrugged his shoulders. Very well, he said, genially. As you please, I simply wish to make matters clear to you. That's all. I wish you joy with Evelyn. I say nothing about her. You love her. Suffice it that I have had her, and I'm tired of her. The field is yours, but keep her out of mischief, and don't let her make a fool of herself in public, if you can help it. And don't let her spend too much money. She costs me a million a year already. Good evening, Mr. Montague. And he went out. Montague, who stood like a statue, could hear him chuckling all the way down the hall. At last Montague himself started to leave, but he heard Mrs. Winnie coming back, and he waited for her. She came in and shut the door and turned toward him. "'What did he say?' she asked. "'He was very pleasant,' said Montague, and she smiled grimly. "'I went out on purpose,' she said. "'I wanted you to see him, to see what sort of man he is, and how much duty I owe him. You saw, I guess.' "'Yes, I saw,' said he. Then again he started to go, but she took him by the arm. "'Come and talk to me,' she said, please. She led him back to the fire. "'Listen,' she said. "'He will not come here again. He's going away tonight. I thought he had gone already, and he does not return for a month or two. There will be no one to disturb us.' She came close to him and gazed up into his face. She had wiped her tears away and her happy look had come back to her. 
she was lovelier than ever. "'I took you by surprise,' she said, smiling. "'You didn't know what to make of it, and I was ashamed. I thought you would hate me. But I'm not going to be unhappy any more. I don't care at all. I'm glad that I spoke.' And Mrs. Winnie put up her hands and took him by the lapels of his coat. "'I know that you love me,' she said. I saw it in your eyes just now, before he came in. It is simply that you won't let yourself go. You have so many doubts and so many fears. But you will see that I am right. You will learn to love me. You won't be able to help it. I shall be so kind and good. Only don't go away. Mrs. Winnie was so close to him that her breath touched his cheek. Promise me, dear, she whispered, promise me that you won't stop seeing me that you will learn to love me. I can't do without you. Montague was trembling in every nerve. He felt like a man caught in a net. Mrs. Winnie had had everything she ever wanted in her life, and now she wanted him. It was impossible for her to face any other thought. Listen, he began gently, but she saw the look of resistance in his eyes, and she cried, No, no, don't. I cannot do without you. Think. I love you. What more can I say to you? I cannot believe that you don't care for me. You have been fond of me. I've seen it in your face. Yet you're afraid of me. Why? Look at me. Am I not beautiful to look at? And is a woman's love such a little thing? Can you fling it away and trample upon it so easily? Why do you wish to go? Don't you understand? No one knows we are here. No one cares. You can come here whenever you wish. This is my place, mine, and no one will think anything about it. They all do it. There's nothing to be afraid of. She put her arms about him and clung to him, so that he could feel the beating of her heart upon his bosom. Oh, don't leave me here alone tonight, she cried. To Montague, it was like the ringing of an alarm bell deep within his soul. I must go, he said. She flung back her head and stared at him. He saw the terror and anguish in her eyes. No, no, she cried. Don't say that to me. I can't bear it. Oh, see what I've done. Look at me. Have mercy on me. Mrs. Winnie, he said, you must have mercy on me. But he only felt her clasp him more tightly. He took her by the wrists, and with quiet force he broke her hold upon him. Her hands fell to her sides, and she stared at him, aghast. "'I must go,' he said again, and he started toward the door. She followed him dumbly with her eyes. "'Good-bye,' he said. He knew that there was no use of any more words. His sympathy had been like oil upon flames. He saw her move, and as he opened the door, she flung herself down in a chair and burst into frantic weeping. He shut the door softly and went away. He found his way down the stairs and got his hat and coat and went out unseen by anyone. He walked down the avenue, and there suddenly was the giant bulk of St. Cecilia's lifting itself into the sky. He stopped and looked at it. It seemed a great tumultuous surge of emotion. And for the first time in his life, it seemed to him that he understood why men had put together that towering heap of stone. Then he went on home. He found Alice dressing for a ball, and Oliver waiting for her. He went to his room and took off his coat, and Oliver came up to him, and with a sudden gesture reached over to his shoulder and held up a trophy. He drew it out carefully and measured the length of it, smiling mischievously in the meanwhile. Then he held it up to the light, to see the color of it. A black one, he cried, coal black. And he looked at his brother, with a merry twinkle in his eyes. Oh, Alan, he chuckled. Montague said nothing. End of chapter 19